So good morning, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. We're in an interesting space uh, right now, heading into um, significant increase in uh, in our uh, wave of infections and um, filling up our ICUs with people uh, from the pandemic. Meanwhile, we've got a um, uh, not one but uh, three vaccines coming out. And so there's a race there. Meanwhile, uh, just like uh, just like everything else, that these have been, become politicized, and uh, our reactions to those have become very politicized. A lot to talk about. We're not going to spend. We spent a lot of time talking about that last week. Um, <clears throat> this week, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. To me, it's. Um, it's much more of a core issue. And here's the point. Um, it was just last week. Janice pointed it out. I meant to go back and find some of those headlines and use them for a slide. They said for the first time during the pandemic, uh, COVID deaths have now overtaken heart attack deaths. As you may remember, Joe Riley had us uh, develop a, a system which we used uh, when we were doing a lot of the daily updates on the, the pandemic. Uh, the system was to show the number of uh, heart attack and stroke deaths compared to the COVID deaths. And again, heart attack and stroke was dwarfing COVID up until very recently. Now, <clears throat> One of the things you should always do whenever you see situations like this is start thinking, okay, is there, uh, so what's causing the COVID deaths? What's causing the heart attack deaths? And it's actually, to a large extent, the same thing causing both. It's cardiovascular inflammation. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit today. The, the article today is about this mix between obesity and COVID-19 because that obesity is driving inflammation, which in turn is driving, uh, is taking people from a relatively mild flu type of illness, coronavirus illness, into COVID, the killer part. So again, when you start looking at all this, it's the same thing killing us, whether it's heart attack, stroke, COVID. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, before we do, again, our a uh, brief word from our sponsor, who is us. Got a lot of other topics uh, that we've got available for you. As I said, we talked, to, we spent time talking about the three COVID vaccines last uh, last week. We've had recent uh, content on stress tests, cardiac caths, stents, and why those don't really predict, uh, prevent heart attack and stroke, and why they are not being done. I mean. They're being done, but they've the the rates of stress tests, cardiac uh, caths, and stents has plummeted. In some places, less than a half of what it was before. Despite the fact that groceries are still selling the same amount of groceries, they're still selling the same amount of tissue paper, but we're not selling anywhere near the same amount of stress tests or stents or cardiac caths. So uh, one of our more popular uh, pieces of content recently has just been this very simple video about inflammation, not cholesterol, is the bigger cause of heart attack and stroke. It's very interesting. Four or five years ago when we started this channel, that was the simple message. And we've been making it simply for about a thousand videos. And yet <clears throat> we do a simple video on it uh, a couple of weeks ago and it, and it took off. So <clears throat> let's uh, talk a little bit more. James and Janice and Michelle and, and Sam and the crowd continue to go back and forth regarding what exactly we want to get out there for you in terms of holiday specials for, uh, for the IR webinar. IR meaning insulin resistance. And again, <clears throat> when we're talking about uh, topics, a lot of key core topics like cardiovascular inflammation. Population-wide, over 80% of cardiovascular inflammation 
damage to our arteries, which means damage to our brain, which means Alzheimer's, which means stroke, which means heart attack, which means uh, heart failure, which means blindness. Uh, people going on, um, on dialysis for their kidneys. 80% of that's due to this issue. And unfortunately, our medical community does not know how to diagnose it. They don't know what to do about it. We're not telling you to quit seeing your doctor. We're not telling you to fire your doctor. We're telling you there's a way that you can figure this out and we can help. So uh, a lot of people, well, one of the more common reasons to come see us is, hey doc, I had a positive calcium score. I asked my doc to, to get a calcium score. He or she didn't want to do it. And I know they don't know how to interpret it. Can you help me here? And of course, supplements are always a popular, uh, popular topic anytime you go on, on YouTube. And supplements are very helpful. They're, they're not going to replace a, you can't out supplement a lifestyle. Just like you can't medicate out medicate a lifestyle. You can't out stent. You can't out bypass a lifestyle issue. But sometimes, uh, sometimes these things help. So, <clears throat> oh, I've, we've had this up here for a couple of seconds. The, uh, the subscription programs, a lot of people like these a lot better. The bottom line is our care is expensive compared to going an insurance route. But when you go the insurance route, what you get is uh, insurance has set up a system where docs spend about seven minutes with you. They do, you know, they'll uh, more often than not see, uh, spend, you, spend about five to 10 minutes with you, write a script and walk into the next room and ask you to come back again later. Um, if you want real care, Sometimes you have to pay for it. These, the subscriptions are a great way for a lot of people to actually go ahead and budget for this. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's funny. I keep trying to get it less and less expensive. The bottom line is the, uh, the care that we're providing now, uh, uh, most people pay more than that for their mortgage. They even pay more than that for their car. And you know what? If you don't have your health, you don't need a house to live in. You don't need a car to drive. So think about your priorities. Um, James has actually spent uh, some uh, time over the past week grinding through. That was his term, grinding through the insulin resistance course. And his point was, yeah, you know, Ford, you're right. In two hours, uh, somebody can know a lot more about insulin resistance and what's causing their health problems than their doctor knows. And again, in medicine, whether we like it or not, it's caveat emptor. It means buyer beware. And you really need to know insulin resistance. You really need to know prediabetes. You really need to know some of these core things in order to protect your own health. I just got a, uh, an email from the uh, publisher of our upcoming book. I thought, you know what? Maybe he's getting ready to publish it. No, uh, I spoke too quick. Uh, it's still going to be some more time, and I'm not sure how long. Uh, <clears throat> the website, we're hitting now over 10,000 uh, views per month. Uh, about a year ago, it was less than 300 views per month. And the reason for it is we're getting our content onto the website itself. Um, and I think... Uh, that's going to be almost it. We've got uh, podcasts for those of you who want to just download some podcasts, put it in your car and drive off or uh, put it on your iPhone and go out for a run. Uh, that's a, this is a great way to do that. There are three places where you can download our uh, podcasts right now. Google Podcasts, Stitcher and Breaker. And I think Sam's having some troubles, some snags getting it loaded onto uh, the Apple podcast uh, format, but we will get there. Be patient with us. And uh, I will tell you, uh, these have already been popular. There's a lot of uh, podcast users out there. So there we go. Now, today we're going to talk about, as I said, um, that toxic mix of too much body fat and COVID-19. As soon as we get the water ball.
So a lot of people have seen it. There was a family in, uh, I think, New Jersey, uh, eight, six or eight months ago. There was a family picture. They had a family gathering. And there was a lot of uh, overweight, um, obvious overweight uh, uh, family members there, or there were a lot. And um, the rest of the story was right after that, there was a huge number of uh, death and uh, there was a huge amount of death and disability in that family uh, due to COVID. What is the issue with COVID and obesity? First of all, let's remember and uh, let's think about the common issue. We used to think that body fat was an inert energy storage tissue. That was up until about five, 10 years ago. And now we realize that's not the case at all. Body fat is a very aggressive hormonal tissue. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. It's that hormonal response that we get from body fat that causes this problem as well as insulin resistance, as well as so many other things that we've talked about, which are to a large extent that common pathway for chronic diseases resulting in diabetes, prediabetes, heart attack, stroke, dementia, you name it. In the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, doctors noticed something about people who became severely ill, that many were obese. Obesity may be one reason some countries or communities are hit hard. In the US, the obesity rate among adults has climbed for decades and is now at 42%. The rate's even higher among Black and Hispanic Americans. The data shows that even adults with a BMI of 30 to 35 will uh, usually will often face far worse outcomes from COVID-19, five times more uh, likely to experience ICU admission compared to those that are, uh, do not, that are not obese, and two times more likely to experience respiratory failure compared to those without obesity. Why is obesity a contributing factor? Well, scientists are still studying the factors. Excess weight increases the chance of developing uh, several health problems, including heart disease and diabetes. Along with the obesity, heart disease and diabetes are among the conditions that increase a person's risk of severe COVID-19 illness, according to CDC. Uh, here's an article out of Annals of Internal Medicine. Obesity and mortality among patients diagnosed with COVID-19 results from an integrated healthcare organization. Obesity itself increases the likelihood of serious complications. The way obesity affects the immune system may be one of the key factors. Sarah Tartoff, a Kaiser Permanente research scientist, speculated that large amounts of visceral fat play a role in severe COVID-19. Fat is not inert. It secretes chemicals that influence bodily systems. It, uh, it, it affects the angiotensin system that helps regulate blood pressure and blood flow, leading to more severe symptoms. Although the exact mechanism is unclear, ectopic fat, uh, let's just forget the word ectopic for right now. Uh, fat and COVID-19 share a common link in the upregulation of pro-inflammatory, pro-thrombotic, and vasoconstricted peptide hormones. Let me translate that. Body fat and COVID-19 both cause immune, um, uh, the immune system to be stimulated and not stimulated in a good way, stimulated in a way where we, the host, are taking friendly fire from our own immune system. Reduced uh, levels of anti-inflammatory adipokines, such as adiponectin in obesity, are associated with increased AT2, angiotensin 2. Again, let me translate that. It's the same as that first sentence. Um, body fat, uh, COVID-19 caused some... Uh, release of hormones which cause inflammation. COVID-19 has been shown to cause that inflammation due to down regulation of, in, of inhibition. So again, you start getting into some logical complications there, but uh, uh, 
we have, we, we're always in a balance. Our immune system is always in a balance. Some things push us to get uh, more immune reactions. Some things push us to slow down that immune reaction. Um, things that are, that are made by our body fat, as in adiponectin, cause us to increase uh, that immune reaction. Things by, uh, made by COVID, the COVID-19 reaction, cause us to stop. They, they break down the mechanism, which is usually tamping down that immune reaction. So you're getting a, com a lethal combination resulting in a spiraling increase of this immune reaction. It's possible that COVID-19 is able to accelerate pathologic injuries from existing substrates like AT2 among people with severe obesity. Jennifer Leiter, an NYU Langone hospital epidemiologist, said that people with obesity seem to have more ACE2 uh, receptors. That's the gateway, if you remember, for the virus. That's what the, the, uh, that uh, spike protein links to. That could explain why men are doing worse and why prepubescent children are faring very well in the, in the pandemic. ACE2, uh, ACE2 receptors. The virus infects cells by attaching to ACE2 receptors, and that receptor is abundant on fat cells. Another study found that the hormone leptin may make them more vulnerable to COVID-19. Now, that's a risk factor. Again, we have to, assuming that it's true, when you look at the, the headline over to the right, obesity, the most common comorbidity in SARS-CoV-2, is leptin the link? Uh, that's what they're asking. You know, they're seeing increased levels of leptin and they're going through some of the potential logic and biological uh, mechanisms. Leptin regu regulates uh, metabolism and appetite and is found in greater amounts in obese people. Obese people become uh, what they call leptin resistant, similar to insulin resistance. High levels of leptin have been associated with a type of systemic inflammatory state. So here we see again, obesity and inflammation. Complications in care can arise once hospitals, uh, hus easy for me to say, huh? Once hospitalized, fat can physically compress parts of the lungs impeding respiration. So here we're talking about just a mechanical problem of ventilating. You know, it's like the old Pickwickian syndrome. You may have heard of it. Uh, it came from um, the the book, uh, James or somebody, r remind me the author of that book, the English author, Pickwick Syndrome. There was a fellow in his book that, had, that was obese and he had trouble breathing because of that obesity. His name was Mr. Pickwick. To help with breathing, doctors have been putting hospitalized patients on their stomachs, but that can be difficult for the obese, making it more likely that they're uh, uh, that they have to be put on a ventilator. Calculating medication doses, inserting intravenous tubes, getting good diagnostic images, and just moving patients around all become far more difficult when you're moving 150 pounds of fat along with a 100 pound or 150 pound patient because the fat goes along with the patient. And now you're at, instead of 150, you're at 250 to 300 pounds of movement and dosing and imaging. For instance, standard doses for painkillers, blood thinners, and other critical medications usually stop at certain weights. What can be done? Aside from the steps to slow down the spread of COVID-19, CDC advises the following. Have a healthy diet. Good nutrition can support optimal immune function. Healthy diet can prevent or support self-management of heart disease, type two diabetes. Obviously be active. Being active can help boost immune function, help prevent diseases and increase a person's chances of having severe, severe illness from COVID-19. Get enough sleep. Insufficient sleep, sleep has been linked to depression as well as chronic diseases that may increase the risk of severe il illness from COVID-19. You know, James has just gotten uh, hooked up with a um, Freestyle Libre, and he, he's been having a lot of discoveries. We're going to 
uh, give him a few minutes to share some of those uh, over the next uh, few YouTube live uh, events. Because of the, of the uh, importance of understanding our blood sugar, one of the things he and I were talking about yesterday afternoon was I find um, I tend to have much lower blood sugar the nights that I'm sleeping really hard. Now, what does that mean? I don't think we know yet, but again, it underlines a couple of the, the uh, unrecognized but very important items in terms of health, our level of blood sugar on a regular basis and our ability to sleep. Uh, one of the problems with, uh, with lack of sleep is that our cortisol levels increase. And sure enough, if you don't get good sleep one night, you have increased insulin resistance for the next 48 hours. And yes, that does appear to be related to cortisol levels. Those of you who haven't read the book or heard of it, it's uh, Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker. It's a very, very good book, entry-level uh, discussion behind the science of sleep and its impact on health. Cope with stress. I knew a, uh, a, uh, an endocrinologist who specialized in diabetes once who felt like stress was actually the root cause of all diabetes. He felt like his perspective was, you know what, we live life, we get more and more stress on an hourly basis. 50, 60 years of it, and that ends up just resulting in insulin resistance, di prediabetes, diabetes. Stress during an, inf an infectious disease outbreak can sometimes cause changes in sleep or eating patterns, increased use of alcohol, tobacco, and worsening of chronic health problems. Now, um, <clears throat> we're gonna actually do bits of two videos today. This first video is a simple, uh, one minute CDC take on the science and the public health components of it. The second part is much more of a human interest perspective. It's, uh, you'll see in a minute. I've always wanted to lose weight for ages and ages, and I, like I think many people, I struggle with my weight, go up and, and down. But when I went into ICU, uh, when I was really ill, I was, I was, I was very, I was way overweight. For, I'm only about five foot 10, uh, you know, at, at, at the outside, and, um, you know, I was too fat. I start the day by going for a, a, a run with the, with the dog. And the great thing about going for a run at the beginning of the day is that nothing could be worse for the rest of the day.
So <clears throat> there we go. Um, somebody on the PrevMed side said, you know, Doc, it was George Bray that wrote the Pickwickian book. Uh, I was thinking a little bit more basic than that. I was thinking of Charles Dickens. Uh, Pick, Mr. Pickwick, I thought, was one of the characters in one of his books. Um, why don't we uh, go ahead and get started? We're uh, set on the Q&A at this point, a uh, couple of them. Our mayor, Al Gayer, hello from Germany. Hello, a mayor. Good to talk to you, Bart. Good to hear that you're here. Erland, hi, Dr. B from Beaverton, Oregon, checking in, staying positive and testing negative. Good for you. Body fat and COVID, big problem. Uh, there. Okay, you know what? Why don't we take a minute, James, if we could, and uh, could you just give us a brief, a brief? Uh, First of all, I have to embarrass you. I was James and I were talking with a, uh, a another associate, and the other associate kept saying, "You know what, guys? I think I may be able to get for you, for you and for your population." a great improved access to uh, Dexcom 6 CGM, con continuous glucose monitoring. And I said, that's fantastic. And um, I, I said, you know, by the way, we're currently doing that with Libra. And James and, and Yanni both said, yeah, I get it, I understand. And James and I went for about, how long was it, James, before you realized? It was over a week. I'm afraid it was over a week. I'm, I thought it was more like three weeks. Anyway, so James is now hooked up, has a uh, has a CGM on his arm as we speak. I do too. James, actually, I'm going to do a, a little strip routine here and take my shirt off and show mine while you tell a little bit about what you're finding out. Uh, how about instead I just play music while you do that? Oh, uh, that's okay. <laughs> so uh, I would, you know, my experience uh, there it is. Mine's in the same spot, uh, but I'm going to keep my clothes on. Uh, uh, otherwise, you'd have a big Bigfoot sighting, a very small Bigfoot sighting if I took my shirt off. <laughs> hey, uh, there's three things that I've discovered in the two weeks that uh, that I've been doing it, and I'm I'm a big fan at this point. Uh, I was I misunderstood, as you said. I was thinking the Libre was. I knew what the Dexcom was. They, I guess, did a better job of advertising to me. I was anticipating with the Libre, it was more of a finger stick, you know, traditional meter, but it wasn't. It's 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 just the same. It's a continuous glucose monitor that attaches. But there's three things, and I have no economic interest whatsoever in Dexcom and Libre ever sent any of those. We've looked at a number of them. So this is this is pure review. Uh, so, but I I have I'm embracing it and I like it a lot. I like what it's done for me over the last two weeks, but I'd describe it in three ways. Number one, it's easy to do. Two, it's engaging. And three, it's effective. Now, I alliterated those by accident, but, but that is true. All three things, um, I find it, number one, easy. Probably the most common question people have is I've told people the last two weeks what I'm doing. And, and when some people have seen it, when I've had a short sleeve shirt on, they immediately think they start feeling sorry for me. Well, I didn't, I didn't realize you had something wrong with you. So, well, it's not a mental health device. If that were <laughs> be appropriate, but it doesn't hurt. So it was easy to apply. It, it comes in an applicator. My pharmacist recommend that I use some uh, skin adhesive strip to make sure it stays on. So I was easily able to apply it and it was easy to sync with my smartphone, like yourself, Ford, I have a, an iPhone, and those two things sync very easily. So those of you who are watching who may think that you have technology challenges, now I don't know what to do if you have a flip phone or, you know, or something, but if you have a smartphone, it's the easiest thing. There's also another meter you can get from the pharmacy, but I find it works very well with my phone. The only negative, the only negative that I found with it, I said is, it will train you to make sure you walk around corners very broadly because I have caught it a couple of times on corners and uh, that's the only time you're going to feel it is if you catch it on a corner uh, of a door or something like that when, you, when you're walking in a room. But it stays on. It's very stable. It's very easy. 
It's engaging. Uh, I, I am very aware, although I would forget that I have it on even sleeping at night. I'm very aware during the day that my choices are going to impact that. So I tested a lot more than usual very early. And now I, I fall into traditional a couple times a day and track it and look at look at all the impacts, the daily patterns. Um, and and the, the software allows you to go in and do something that's very important. And that's the log. So I can log what I've eaten. I can log what I've drank. I can log behaviors. Have I exercised? Was I active? And then I've done something, as you said, I'm overlaying it myself a little bit where I downloaded on my iPhone a sleep app. And each night when I go to bed, I turn that sleep on app on it tracks my sleep. I was a little skeptical of these sleep apps. However, I've engaged with it and I've noticed a pattern um, in the mornings on, on nights that it tells me I did not sleep well. My fasting glucose is always higher. So last night it told me I had a terrible sleep and I did. I only deep slept for about one hour and I light slept for about five hours, even though I went to bed early. I went to bed early. For some reason, I wouldn't go into why I didn't sleep well. I woke up a lot last night. But this morning when I did my fasting glucose, it was at 100. Normally I'm in the high 80s, the low 90s. And so I, I track my sleep and I track my blood sugar, my fasting, as well as my afternoons. And I have a very consistent pattern throughout the day. I am very mindful of what I'm eating, what I'm drinking. But I find the most interesting thing is that, that my cortisol, evidently, we can talk about that and then talk about leptin as a hormone. Cortisol is an hormone and, uh, and obesity. But there is something, evidently, in the mornings, maybe because I'm starting my day, I'm talking with you on the phone very early in the mornings. That's raising my cortisol levels because of stress, maybe, who knows? And my blood sugar is, uh, is, is the highest is in the morning when I'm fasting. It's higher than after lunch when I eat. Of course, I'm on a high fat, low carb diet. So my three o'clock numbers are significantly lower than my nine o'clock numbers, especially on nights when I don't get three, four hours of REM sleep. That's not uncommon at all. Uh, I get a lot of folks. One of the things they uh, they start they focus on once they start realizing the importance of blood sugars, they, they focus on what's called the dawn effect. The dawn effect is due to the fact that the vast majority of us have an increase in cortisol between five, four and six in the morning. That cortisol causes our liver to start pushing out glucose. I have never seen a, uh, a dawn effect, which was routinely getting people into uh, dangerous levels of uh, blood sugar. Um, these, it, when we'll have an event, we'll often take these um, uh, finger sticks with us and people will be surprised. They'll say, wait a minute, my blood sugar was higher before breakfast than it was afterwards. And just like you've described, what happens is you're pushing that, your, glu your uh, glucose is being pushed by cortisol in the morning. You eat something and then you get a bolus of uh, of insulin as a response to that to what you eat <clears throat> so we've got uh, quite a few comments and again i think uh, uh, folks that use this cgm begin to realize there's a whole bunch of stuff that i learned and we used to say eat to the glucometer james was saying gosh you know what you live to the glucometer you realize what you need to be doing in terms of developing muscle mass uh, the more you develop good muscle mass, uh, the better those muscles pull that blood sugar in, even if your receptors are, uh, are resistant to insulin. Uh, sleep, big impact. We just talked about some of that. For You, you get poor sleep and your blood sugars are going to average a little bit higher for the next 48 hours. Um, and obviously stuff like activity. You can take a carb vacation, which many of us will do during these upcoming holidays. Remember, you take a carb vacation, you go a little bit higher um, your, on your blood sugar, you walk around, you don't have to do major aggressive hill runs, just gentle walking will pull that blood sugar out of the, that sugar out of your blood and into the muscles, the large muscles of your body. So let's deal with a couple of comments, questions. Chuck K, how, hi doc, how do you know which vaccine to take? 
Great question. Thanks for raising it. Uh, real quick answer. You're probably not going to get your choice for quite a few months. Uh, we're you know, we're going to be in a scarcity mode. Uh, James and I talked for a couple of times last week, as well as uh, a couple of weeks before that, as with anything, there's a lot of politics around this and anything else. There's a whole lot of folks that we would label as, I would label as vaccine haters. James would say, oh, no, wait a minute. There's a whole spectrum along that line. But here's the bottom line. There's clearly more people out there that want to have the vaccine than there's going to be vaccine available over the next what, six months at least. I'm going to, I'm personally going to take the first vaccine that I can get. I am predicting that's probably going to be the BioNTech uh, vaccine. And I'm going to use this as an opportunity to, to go down a little bit of a bunny hole in that space. You may have heard that uh, there were a couple of anaphylactic reactions to BioNTech. And the answer is yes. When they did the rollout in the UK, there were. Now, how common is that going to be? Prior to that UK rollout, what, 20,000, 40,000 people had been given this vaccine in the, uh, the pre-market clinical trials. Uh, that was not a big, uh, if it were going to be common, you would have thought you would have seen it beforehand. Um, I do not think it's a major risk. I have a family member, my son has, um, anaphylactic level allergies to tree nuts. Uh, he and I talked, he and my wife talked, I shared with them a, a great article that I found on this space. And the bottom line is this, I'm advising that he get the vaccine as soon as he can as well, even if it's the bio intake, uh, bio in, uh, I'm now I'm having a senior moment, bio intake uh, vaccine, because uh, he, here's, and I'm also advising him, obviously, take your, uh, uh, your EpiPen with you when you go to get that shot. But uh, here's where some of the politics come in. A lot of folks that are very nervous about vaccines do approach this as, well, there are negative problems. I'm expecting that if this is recommended to me by the government or by doctors or whatever, there's never going to be a problem. You need to assure me that. If somebody's looking for assurance that nothing bad is ever going to happen from a vaccine, now you're not going to get it here. It's like a car. It's like getting on a bus. It's like getting on an airplane. You weigh your benefits, you weigh your risks. And uh, right now, I'm uh, recommending the vaccine for myself and for uh, family members, even though I have one family member who does have an anaphylactoid uh, tendency. James, I see you grimacing and uh, groaning over there. I'm sure you got to make, you want to make a comment. You want to uh, add a little comment color from the other side? No, I, I think that's reasonable. You and I, you and I agree. I'm in this topic. I, I do play the part of defender and you said it well, it's a spectrum. Um, last week we talked a great deal about the vaccine. And I think the day afterwards on Thursday, the article came out about the vaccine in Australia that was using HIV <laughs> piggyback. And then people were testing positive HIV. Yes. Thank you guys for sending us that information. We looked at it and it was a great conversation because, uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, CRISPRs and the other technologies that are using piggyback technology to get into the gene code is using, for instance, um, uh, herpes virus. So viruses are often used in that role and, and HIV, at least in this, in this story, they were saying they were negatively testing positive. I don't want a negative, I don't want a false positive HIV response. I don't want a positive HIV response. I mean, I can see where that would absolutely scare people to death and it's amplified. So we understand that during this time, the risk are amplified. The concerns are amplified. We can't extricate politics from it. But I think you're very reasonable. Healthcare workers, I don't think we have a choice but to be vaccinated. The, the, yes, there is a risk, but we also accept a lot of risk. We accept the risk of being exposed to all types of, of illnesses as a result of uh, infectious diseases, being physicians or being uh, in the front line of healthcare workers. So I think it's just understanding what that risk is. 
there's a spectrum of people. I'm one of those that, yes, I'll probably wait and see if you grow a third eye and then probably go be vaccinated myself. But because of the conversation we had uh, with my children who are not obese, so I don't think they're going to have a lot of risk associated with uh, COVID. They're young. They probably don't have a lot of ACE receptors. So for my children, I'd say I'm willing to I'm willing to balance that for a four-year-old, a five-year-old, or a seven-year-old. But to the parents, to my parents, if my mom were still alive, I'd absolutely say you need to get the vaccine. The risk, the risk and the reward is balanced. Well, well put. So actually, you and I, I meant to get back to you on that uh, Australian vaccine. I looked at that and thought. Were they really consciously using the HIV virus as a, and what I read did not indicate that. It indicated that there was a, there happened to be a cross reactivity to HIV testing, antibody testing afterwards. Not that they were using that virus, but you know, I'm sure some folks will wanna, wanna fact check us on that. Interesting conversation though, and thanks for it, it creates a reasonableness, reasonableness for people to be concerned. Yeah. It's reasonable. It's just is, can you calm your fears once you understand all the facts? Yep. I think it's reasonable to, to do that. And again, I think it helps a whole lot to have a little bit more balance on this show rather than just one person, you know, even if it is me spouting uh, what I believe, I appreciate the, uh, the input. Uh, input. Joseph Bates, good morning from St. George, Utah. Good morning, Joseph. Good morning, John Tocho. Early Merry Christmas. Happy New Year in case I miss next week's live stream. That sounds like you're planning on missing it, John. We'll miss you. Erland, had my stress as echo last week. Lived through it. Heart appears to be okay. Shows low resting heart rate of 45 to 124 beats, when, uh, beats per minute when stressed. Shows no need for pacemaker. Excellent. Glad to hear that, Erland. And that actually is one of those other indications. You know, people say, well, Doc, you'd never recommend a stress, ec a stress test. There are times when stress tests make sense. Uh, for example, the one that Erland just described, when you're worried about uh, what's called six sinus syndrome and some other things, um, makes more sense then. The major concern is, Stress to, uh, hey, is what Tim Russert did uh, with Dr. Michael Newman. You know, his, his question was, hey, doc, we're having some blood pressure problems. I'm uh, having some issues. Can I just make sure I'm not going to have a heart attack? And again, Michael Newman was really clear that that uh, he, he knew the science. He knew what was going on there. And again, won't go down that bunny trail uh, again right now. Christian Allen, my blood glucose level will rise 10 to 15 higher than normal on one gram time release niacin. Is this normal or will my body adjust back to old normal? Christian, great question. Fantastic question. And the answer is yes. Yes and yes. It is normal for you to get some increase in blood sugar associated with uh, niacin. And that typically lasts between three and nine months. After that, you tend to, uh, your body tends to accommodate back down. Now, there, in this space, there's another very, very common uh, medication which does the same thing. It's statins. Most statins, in fact, all of them except patavastatin, Lavalo. And now that I've mentioned a brand name, we will, uh, uh, the, the Google AI, the YouTube AI is going to do some things to us. But either way, there's only one statin that does not push us down this uh, diabetes highway a little bit, and that's patavastatin uh, or Lavalo. It's also got some other names when, it's come, when it comes from outside the country. Is but that, is that water soluble for Yeah. There's, yeah the, and part of that difference is the water solubility. So um, because of that, the makers know that it's very valuable, so they charge a lot more than they do for the other statins. When you charge more for something, you're going to get a, have a hard time getting the insurance companies to pay for it. A lot of my uh, patients, and I have done this in the past as well, uh, got Lavalo or a version, a, a generic uh, version of patavastatin through Canadian pharmacies. The 
the one Canadian pharmacy online, the generic they used was uh, Pivesta, I think. Now, with the statins and their increase in blood sugar, that does not go away in three to six months like you tend to see with niacin. So just a couple of quick comparisons about this space. Thank you, Christian. It was a great, great topic. Erland, I see three ways to track carbs on keto. Carb, calorie, percent, total calories is less than or equal to 10%. Total carbs equals or or less than 50 grams or net carbs less than 20. You did a video of Dave who lost lots of weight. You're probably talking about Dave Murphy. Uh, at this point, he's what, 160 pound weight loss. He used total carbs less than 20 grams. What's best? I'll tell you what's best. It's really clear. And, and if you have an interest in it, uh, there's a great book by Jenny Rule, R-U-H-L. She's got two books. One of them is Blood Sugar 101. The book I'm referring to for this specific topic is Diet 101. When, um, uh, when Atkins died, he was a very wealthy man and he'd gotten beat up on this issue of uh, the keto diet for quite a bit. Uh, he left a lot of his money to doing some uh, very specific clinical trials on diets. That had not really been done that well prior to that. A lot of interesting information came out of it. One of them was keto diet doesn't hurt you. A lot of us felt prior to those, uh, to those studies that keto diet, because of all the fat, could be dangerous. Um, <clears throat> keto diet is also very effective. Now, here's the bottom line, though, that came out of every one of those studies. The best diet's not a diet. The best diet is a change in your lifestyle. If you can't maintain your diet for six months or more, if you cannot change the way you eat permanently, it does you no good. So that's the reason I went there, Erland, is I get a lot of people who go really hard on keto and get a lot of early impact, but it's also a lot easier to fall off the wagon. Uh, I personally do a kinder, gentler, low carb, but uh, I don't try to reach ketosis all the time. James, any comments about that? You've uh, you've gone down that path yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. I lost. Uh, you you had me on three years ago, I guess it was when when my blood pressure was out of control and my weight was out of control, and um, I, I'm, I did the combination of ketosis with uh, keto diet with fasting, intermittent fasting. I'm still, my lifestyle still embraces fasting. So that's the point that you made. I lost about 35 pounds at the peak and trough, probably picked up over time. I'll flux about within a range of about 10 pounds. Um, holidays are usually, uh, when you get the top of that trough and down. But again, when you, when I heard you a few months ago for the first time, really it stuck with me eat to the glucometer. And as I've embraced that, I think that's that's just so much easier to log. It's a little bit of work on the front end, but you start logging and seeing what impact certain foods have on you because you can log that in the software when you do these CGMs. Um, I think that's just coaching people, encouraging people, try that, see where you stay within your range and just learn to adapt the lifestyle with the kind of foods that you can tolerate, that you like, that you eat and uh, and, and make it work for you. I'm trying to show my number while you're doing that. You and you, you're getting a a quick um, in-depth survey on. Ah, uh, gosh, you know what? Yeah, green problems. But the yeah. bottom line is, speaking of eating to the glucometer and speaking of trying to maintain keto. So, because of our recent activities, James and I have been very busy. We've got a lot of other uh, corporations interested in businesses interested in what we're doing and how to get this, these messages out to people. So my, uh, Janice and I have been struggling recently to be able to eat together, and, you know, some of the basic, simple time spending things. She did something right, but she, uh, she went to uh, one of the local grocery stores that has some neat different types of foods. One of those foods was, it was a cauliflower latke. Mm. She knows that I'm watching my carbs. She'd heard about it. She got some for me. I went down. 
I had one and it was great. And then I thought, you know what? You got to take a look and make sure that they didn't slip something else in there. Right. Sure enough, on, on a regular basis, I'm staying below 100 now. But those cauliflower latkes, that's a, for those of you not familiar with it, I, that was the first time I'd ever heard of it. It's a type of a, of a pancake. Uh, and these things were held together with um, potato and rice flour. So now my blood glucose has gone up to 110, 111. I'm not worried about it. Uh, I got about 20 grams of carbs. That's going to be most of the carbs that I get for the rest of the day. But to me, uh, it's a lot easier to change my lifestyle that I'm, so that I'm watching my carbs. And as James just said again, and I don't mean to interrupt James, but I thought it was a great entree to this concept of eating to the glucometer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, it, it, it's a game. There's, there's an effect. One of the points I was making about, and we'll go into more detail when we do a, a show on this, but there's a sense in the human brain that all these social media platforms have learned that the human brain loves gamification. We love competition it's embedded in us. So you, you, when you get on the glucometer, you'll find that you're competing with yourself. There, you remember that the, there was, I told you about this episode. I don't think you were a Seinfeld fan, but for those Seinfeld fans that are on here, you, there was an episode where uh, Kramer and the post office, uh, the postal worker were driving a car that went to empty and they wanted to see how far could they get the car to go while it was on empty and they drive completely out of the city without realizing the fact that they go 30 miles outside of the city and then run out of gas. <laughs> to prove how far could they make this car go with the empty light showing? So that was that human gamification of, of competing with yourself. And there's a sense of that that I think makes this successful is how, how well can I maintain what all can I eat and how can I win this game with myself of of not just weight. Weight is very difficult because, because we know your weight can fluctuate and get very frustrating when you get on the uh, weight scale in the mornings and you've gained two pounds and you did everything right the day before, right? You did everything. You get on, you say, I just gained two pounds. Then you do something wrong and you go, oh, I hate to look at it. And you, you've lost two pounds and it's easy to throw your hands up. But there's a truth to the glucometer that watching that and going, my game is to keep it below 100 or to keep it below 110 even after I eat. And then I've noticed I've, I've lost about five pounds in this two weeks and I, I only needed to lose about five or six pounds. You know, I'm, I'm, I was in a real good range at this point. And, and so I've lost some weight through this process. And I know it's that gamification, that, that impact I'm having where I'm very mindful that I'll be frustrated when my, when my number goes to 120, even if I've eaten uh, something that uh, was a big meal. So I, I, that gamification effect to eat and live according to the meter. So when I have eaten something that I go, I'm not sure about that. I'm going to go walk for 20 minutes up and down the hill because I, when I, when I look at this meter in an hour or two hours, I want to, I want to beat that thing. And I think most humans are going to be that way and they'll find it very, they'll start enjoying their diet because they've entered, they put their brain engaged with some, some primitive human game, uh, uh, urge that we have uh, within ourselves. You're bringing up a good point. And I had noticed this con comment down earlier, this question from Joe Stevens. What BMI, you're talking about managing BMI. So what BMI number do you consider the maximum level to consider tolerable for health? Not optimal, but tolerable. I'll ask this for those in excess of BMI of 30. So, I got to go here. I'm going to um, uh, let me show something real quick. Are you able to see my uh, screen? Yes. So this is Arnold Schwarzenegger. In 1970, his BMI was 30. We used to think that maybe it was just load on the heart. So, uh, a, a, a BMI like that may have been a major problem. The reality is, no, it's not load on heart. We've found out since then 
that it is body fat. As we discussed multiple times in the program today, body fat has a major negative impact on our immune system, on our insulin uh, management, et cetera. Now back to your question, Joe, you know, if you look like that, um, and I don't know if Joe's a, I'm assuming Joe might be a female. Obviously you don't want to look like that, but if, if the, uh, if it's a male and the male looks like that, I'm not convinced that that's a major risk factor. For now, Thank you for not putting my picture up there. I know that you wanted to, to illustrate yeah. that, but that would have embarrassed me. I'm so much alike. Exactly. I'm, I'm sure. In fact, we'll do that at some point. If I had the time, I'd reply, I'd do, I'd Photoshop your face there, but here's the, here, there are a couple of problems with this. The first one is, um, uh, once you get that kind of weight, uh, it's a challenge continuing to maintain that much weight and maintain such low body fat. So the game here is body fat. Now, uh, a related comment is that one of the biggest risk factors for us as humans, once we reach age 65, our mid sixties and above is muscle loss. And trying to tease out is it muscle loss because what's the connection between muscle loss and and death? Well, one of those connections is very probably the fact that um, and it, there's a huge correlation between muscle loss beyond age 65 and inflammation, cardiovascular inflammation. Well, how do you tease those two things out, which are very related? to insulin resistance. It's just not easy. There, you get that triumvirate of muscle loss, insulin resistance, cardiovascular inflammation, and those lead to major health risks. Now, I realize, Joe, I'm not really responding to your comment about what's, quote, tolerable, because frankly, I struggle with the, how, how do I define tolerable? in terms of tolerable for risk factors. You know, each of my patients has to, each of us as individuals has to define for ourselves what is tolerable. Uh, another comment associated with this is um, uh, this assumption that, you know what, doc, uh, and men tend to do this more than women. Men tend to think, you know what, yeah, I'm heavy, but it's mostly muscle. Hmm. No, nah, I'm not so sure. Be careful. I mean, do you really look like Arnold did in those pictures that we were talking about? Any uh, other related comments, James? No, uh, we're getting a lot of comments on that uh, later in the thread <clears throat> and uh, several about fasting and, and, and the mindset. I think that's a good point. <clears throat> I think you got to approach this with that. There is no acceptable, uh, high level of body fat because once you once you understand that as you talked about a little bit earlier the impact of adiponectin and that you actually have this living organism secreting bad chemicals and doing these bad bad things to your entire uh, system your heart your lungs your liver your covid your infectious your immunity then once you understand that you want to you want to be done with it so as a as a starting point there's no acceptable starting point it is the starting point. You just say, all right, today I'm going to live my life in a way to lower my blood sugar, which will impact weight loss with a few exceptions of maybe someone has some genetic problem with their leptin uptake and others, but those are rare. Most people, I think if they, if their mentality is whatever it is today, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to either use fasting, use diet, use lifestyle and change then it really wouldn't matter if you're 40, it's not gonna be 40 tomorrow. It's not gonna be 40 in the near future. I'm going to attack this because I understand the impact that it has on my life and the lives of the people around me because you know, I'm preaching now, but the one thing we didn't talk a lot about this is that you mentioned it, that family image where that one family lost several family members, the choices you're making is impacting other people you know, saying, well, this is my life. Let me live it. No, your pattern 
your choice, what you're cooking, what you're eating, what you're sticking in your shelves, where you're choosing to go eat, and, and others, your children grown or not grown, your brothers, your siblings, see that life pattern, they fall into similar patterns, and they may not have the luxury of surviving a COVID diagnosis or a heart attack or stroke. So you, you got you to gotta approach it with this warrior mentality that says fat is bad. Uh, I want to I want to change and I've got to do the things I have to do to do it. So a lot of comments like that, that other people piling on a little bit. But I think that's uh, I think that's correct. I saw a patient yesterday who <clears throat> came to uh, one of our events, discovered at that event that he was not uh, he was in his late 50s. He was not pre-diabetic. He was full blown diabetic and also discovered that he had major plaque. That was a wake up call for him. He saw that meeting. He, he still refers to it as a boot camp. We didn't set it up as a boot camp. I'm not uh, I'm not that much of a rah rah kind of person, but he lost another 20, 30 pounds. Um, and then he started. Uh, uh, now he's in he's he's in a major part of that lifestyle struggle. And why? His kids are eating uh, pastas. His wife is making pasta for the family. She'll occasionally make a, a, a substitute type of pasta for him, but lifestyle is critical and we don't do that alone. Uh, you know, we try and some of us are, are able to do it, but what was that quote? There's no mayonnaise in Ireland. No, I think is there's no man is an island, and uh, to your point, um, it is our lifestyle spills over on our loved ones. And be be careful. Please think about that, especially uh, as you uh, as you deal with this. Another comment that James uh, reminded me of is that you're not too young to start worrying about about your uh, health. I've seen several twenty something year olds. Most of them came to me because their parents were my patients. A couple of them had some real significant insulin resistance problems and plaque, despite the fact they were 20s, 20 somethings. Other comments before we move ahead? So, uh, Bambi Grage, good to talk to you. Good to hear from you, Bambi. Sister going in for angioplasty as we speak. She wasn't open for your info as she was really scared. I'll keep you posted. You know, Bambi, we saw, we had another, uh, we had somebody attend one of our uh, webinars just last week and he was just diagnosed with um, diabetes and his doc's wanting to do a stent. And yes, we covered what we talked about with stents and stuff and his wife was at the meeting and she said, gosh, you know, should he really be getting it? And I said, you know, here's what happens. I have a lot of people that come to me and find out they have this problem at about the same time that their doc is recommending a stent. Um, it takes a lot of guts to say, you know what? I'm not going to get that stent. Um, I have a lot of people do that. I also have a lot of people say, you know what? I'm going to have suspenders and a belt. I'm going to go ahead and get that stent, but um, but I'm also going to realize that that's got less of a of a probability of fixing me than my lifestyle. Here's the real problem I have with stents. I don't think they're that dangerous. I don't think that stress tests are that dangerous. I don't think that a cardiac cath is that dangerous. Here's what's dangerous. The same thing you saw with Tim Russert. This I'm glad I don't have a problem. And then you go, right, you don't make the changes, those tough changes that you need to make on lifestyle. So a stent's not usually going to kill you, but it's not going to save you. The lifestyle will. Great, great comment. Thank you for sharing it. Good morning from Richardson, 75080. John, I was wearing the free, I wear the freestyle every, uh, two weeks of every month to stay aware of levels. Very easy to apply and I really like the continuously available reading. Thank you, John. You know, they did, they've done research on, it's amazing what they've done research on. One of the things they've done research on is how much should you really know? If you're, for example, 
a significant diabetic who's maintaining your blood sugars and even insulin levels, uh, what they tended to find out was beyond doing this a quarter of the time period, um, uh, you, you got only marginal improvements in your, in your management. So John, I would, I would applaud you. I, I tend to do more like you do a little bit more often. I'll go a couple of months sometimes without wearing one, but then uh, anytime you have a significant change, you really should uh, try it again just to know, just to have a, have a dashboard. You know, how often do you want to take the dashboard off of your car and drive around? Good morning, Richardson. Oops, I think we're, we're getting repeats here. Uh, that's uh, the question about BMI. San Diego here. Thank you, Christian. Erlen, I use a, EMR, a CGM to adjust my eating plan. Recently brought an, um, bought an Ambrosia Systems unit that fits over the Libre and continually sends glucose readings to my iPhone. I'll let you know how it works. That would be helpful. James, actually, I was not aware of anything other than Libre and Dexcom. James, when he discovered the Libre, uh, started looking around and found out there are what now, three or four? I found four so far. Uh, January, it's a little different. It's called January. It's got AI involved in it. And ever since, there's another one out of Maryland. And we're doing a little bit of homework around those. Yeah, we will. Uh, again, this is such an important topic. We are going to cover uh, a little bit more detail when it is time develops. In fact, one of the things we're going to do, uh, weight loss is always developing a New Year's resolution that, you know what, I'm going to get control of my health again, uh, is a big, big deal. We tend to see an influx of patients during that time period as well. One of the things we'll be doing is help uh, focus on tools that can help people with weight loss. James, I don't know if you have any other comment around that. Nope, just working on it. Absolutely. MOSPAC 72. This is interesting information. The CDC respends, rescinds guidance opposing hydroxychloroquine chloroquine for COVID. That's interesting. I had not heard that yet, MOSPAC. You know, I, um, although I had, I did use some early on, I had some, uh, a uh, few physician patients that wanted uh, me to write that for them, and I did. Had some other patients that wanted me to write that for them, I did. Um, I used a little bit less of it over the past month or two. I don't use it prophylactically. I've had a few uh, folks request prophylactic hydroxychloroquine. I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm very interested to hear that the CDC has, has walked back their opposition. Any comments on that, James? Most comments would be political, so we'll just leave it alone. <laughs> well, I, I gave you a layup. I know. I just, I think every, nobody needs to comment. We'll just all just observe. Yeah, no. OAG. Uh, OAG is a great friend and patient. He is like the ultimate farm to table. He's got a great farm in rural Alabama. I've had, I've tried to have him on the uh, on the YouTube live a couple of times, but he's so far out in Alabama, we really can't get that to work. But we did get a couple of uh, of YouTube videos, and those have been very popular. Uh, OAG is what pushing eighty, I think, and uh, he's got his own YouTube channel. I, you know, I thought I was something at age sixty, have, being a YouTuber. He's got me beat hands down. He actually. Uh, was very active in the rocket industry. So he's got a little bit of an unfair advantage over us in terms of technology. Uh, what, what's that? Roll Tide. Yeah. So one of the continuing quotes I saw from him, he, he was one of these folks that uh, left a comment on the YouTube channel. He said, hey, Doc, you know what? I took your tests. He was talking about the... Um, the OGTT and insulin, uh, insulin response test. He said, I wasn't pre-diabetic. I was full-blown diabetic. And my doctors did not know this. He's very supportive of his docs. I mean, he's like, I think a little bit more like me on that approach that, you know, docs, there's no need to beat up on primary care docs. It's something they don't know. That's fine. Let's fix it and move on. 
one of the things he said in terms of his um, habits was, gosh, I always love these, uh, uh, not Dorito chips, you know, the corn chips. And he said, you know, I was, it was one of my indulgences. I stopped that one thing and in my late seventies dropped like 30 or 40 pounds, had to buy new pants, new belt, everything. So again, just a great uh, demonstration of, you know what, once we start looking at, once we develop a dashboard and start looking at things like blood sugar and our body's response to blood sugar, we can make, you know, it's like looking down at your, your dashboard when you're driving and realizing, oh gosh, and you know what, I'm going 90 miles an hour. I'm going 80 miles an hour in a 50 time zone. I mean, in a, in a 50 speed zone. So let me back up a little bit. Mark P, has anyone used SM, MSM, methylsiphonyl methane, to control inflammation in cortisol? I'm not familiar with that. Are you, James? Thank you. Thank you, Chuck. Thumbs up. I forget to, to do that. Guys, if you do, if you will put a thumbs up on there, and right now on my on my dashboard, I'm seeing only two thumbs up. Somebody told me that I'm not seeing all of them, that there are more out there than, than you see. But when you do a thumbs up, that tells the, um, the YouTube AI, artificial intelligence, the algorithm, that there's interest here. And it'll, uh, it will increase its uh, suggestions to other people to watch it. I'll tell you a secret. Even if you do a thumbs down, it tends to, 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 to suggest it to more people. And the point is, you know what? It's not just boring stuff. It's stuff that you can get engaged with. John uh, Tocho, nice to see OAG in the house. I agree. Thank you for your videos, OAG. Uh, John Tocho, thank you. I'll be doing more as I have time. How does D3 play with the vaccines? Um, not sure. I mean, and, uh, I have not heard anything uh, one way or another. Again, you get twenty to forty thousand people taking it. Um, I don't. I, I think you've got, got all levels of the spectrum of level of D three levels. I've not heard any significant impacts with any of them. Be open if somebody uh, finds out something. Chuck Rogers. Good morning, Doctor Brewer. Sixty six. Uber fit. BMI 22, excellent. Keto carnivore diet, time for low dose Crestor. Well, I don't, I don't recommend Crestor for LDL levels, Chuck. I recommend it if you have plaque. I am blessed to have a great doctor in Naples, Florida, Dr. David Scott, D-O. I don't know Dr. Scott. Um, at Rob, maybe off topic, but did I hear your channel to notify your dentist if you have aortic stenosis and why? Have cleaning appointment soon. Well, I'll tell you what, if you have any, I don't know that it was on my channel, but here's the thing. If you have any cardiac valve problem, yes, you should make your doctor aware. In fact, we used to recommend in the past that uh, the doc give you, that the dentist give you antibiotics before they do work on your teeth because of this um, connection between oral health and systemic health. Uh, there, uh, the science is going, is supporting that uh, use of antibiotics prophylactically less and less, but that, that may have been what you heard. And again, I don't think you heard it on our channel. You did hear a lot of discussion on our channel about the connection between oral and systemic health. And here's one of the, of the simple tips. If you've had bleeding of your gums when you go to the dentist, be afraid, be very afraid. And the reason for that is the most common cause for uh, bleeding when you go to the dentist is inflammation of your gums. And guess what the most common cause of that is? Prediabetes. OAG, I'm 81 and doing great. You're doing a lot better after giving up those corn chips. Thank you for doing it. And thank you for sharing that with others. That makes such a big impact. You know, it's 
one thing to hear a doc get up and yak, but it's very, very different for to hear a patient say, you know what? I tried it and it worked. William Thurman, a week ago I tested positive for COVID. Other than head congestion, the first few days I've had, I have felt no different. Maybe getting a little tired after being physically active. Is this normal? It is. You see a lot more people who have just a fairly mild problem and headache uh, than you see people dying from COVID. That is one of the reasons why this whole thing and our government and society's reaction has become very politicized. Joseph Bates, I did keto for two years, then went to zero carb this year. I started Carney as a 30 day experiment, carnivore, still on it. This whoa is easy peasy way of eating, I guess, is easy peasy because it's so satiating and nourishing. The benefits have been amazing, I'm sold. You see a lot more people on the YouTube talking about carnivore. I don't know, James, if you're familiar with that, but oh, yeah. obviously you're going to get zero carbs on a carnivore diet. Uh, a lot of people uh, make assumptions that I'm going to pull my hair out and say that's awful. I'm not. I've got several patients that are on a carnivore diet. Um, I, in many ways, I don't, I don't really have a whole lot to say about it. Do you? No. Uh, <clears throat> I've read I've read a little bit about it and started tracking it. I think it'd be a great topic in the future. A little bit of homework we probably need to do. One of the things that's interesting is the connection with some forms of mental health, depression, anxiety, and some maybe anecdotal at this point, some connections with people seeing improved uh, improved results with their mental health as they shifted to more of a carnivorous diet. It's interesting. I, I don't have a study yet in my hand, but there's some interesting, you know, interesting data out there. I, it goes back to what you talk about cholesterol. I had this conversation recently with someone and they go, well, what's your cholesterol? I said, well, how many people have heart attacks with normal cholesterol? I don't know. Well, how many have it with high cholesterol? It's 50, 50. So I don't know what that tells me. I'm not discounting cholesterol, but I'm saying I, that one factor alone, is not the question. It's insulin resistance. It's sugar. Certainly there's not a lot of sugar when I'm eating, you know, my, my bacon diet. So, uh, I think I could try it for 30 days. If you could give me some coupons to prime rib for the next 30 days, I could probably suffer through that. I'd try it. Uh, don't hold your breath. <laughs> you can't prescribe that. So Send I I can prescribe it. I, good luck on, well, you know. Well, if, if the listeners could all pull together, send me a bunch of Omaha steaks yeah. uh, for Christmas, I'll, uh, I'll I'll spend January and then report back to you guys how my how my diet went. Or not report at all. Either that or my widow will report back how it went. Actually, I've seen some amazing results on that carnivore diet, especially associated with weight loss. Right. Uh, you tend to get that that decrease in the blood sugar doing this business. Mm -hmm. M ball. This is a very interesting comment. Obesity makes it harder to raise vitamin D levels and people with low vitamin D level have worse outcomes with COVID. Very, very interesting point. Vitamin D is a blood soluble, I mean, a fat soluble vitamin. And uh, I, for the first time recently, I was listening to a uh, uh, a a video on vitamin D and they, for the first time ever, I heard the origin of the word vitamin. It was supposed to be vital Emmy. So interesting point. Now, yes, it's fat soluble. And that actually, I think comes to the point that I, the experience I see people say, Oh, you know what? If all, you don't have to worry about supplementing vitamin D, especially if you spend a lot of time outside. I get more husband and wife couples that come to me and they and they've got the opposite. The husband's playing golf four to 20 hours per week outdoors and has a lower vitamin D level than the wife who's indoors all the time. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that men tend to have more body fat. Uh, so, no, I would not uh, depend on sunshine. And one of the major reasons is exactly the reason that M. Ball brings up. When you, uh, when the COVID thing hit, 
uh, vitamin D was always one of my top three um, uh, supplements, and it went from maybe maybe number two to maybe number one because of the COVID outbreak. Great comment. Thanks for asking it. William Thurman, what's a glucopter? Well, uh, I'm assuming you're saying what is a glucometer? James, you want to take the first cut on that? Uh, later in the notes, you'll see uh, someone replies. He says, okay, and acknowledges it. At the time, I'm like you. I was reading it and said, well, it could be he's referring to our South Carolina and Tennessee accents, but I think he was generally asking, and someone in ball responded a blood glucose monitor. And uh, so he, and he responds, good. So uh, I wasn't sure if he meant, hey, guys, get you, you know, Spend a little, spend a little time and learn to pronounce your words. But he wasn't. He was saying, actually, genuinely, what is it? Well, I will tell you this: if there's a desire for me to get rid of my accent, I worked on that. Did you see the movie um, Bugsy with? Uh, I can't remember what his name was. He lived in New York, and on the way, <clears throat> uh, the way to work uh, with the gangsters that he was working with, he would practice his speaking. I actually did that when I lived in New York. Uh, I actually um, got away from whenever I'd speak to somebody in New York, them saying, where are you from, boy? Just making fun of my accent. We moved to Nashville in less than 24 hours. It was all back. So well, it should be. We're not the ones with the accent for it. <laughs> Fine. Good comment, OAG. You're right. 50% Americans, too fat. 50% Americans also happen have either insulin resistance or full-blown diabetes. And there you go. As you said, Imbal got the message, blood glucose meter. Uh, you need to fast. Yes, you do. I'm One of the recent videos we did was on the New England Journal. I think it was uh, December 26th, the day after Christmas of 2019, the New England Journal came out with a, um, a science review article on intermittent fasting. And their point was, and my point on covering it was, you know what? It looks like intermittent fasting has transitioned from being a weird YouTube doctor, uh, YouTuber thing to being uh, at least the uh, the highest levels of medicine, standardized medicine, say, and yet intermittent fasting makes sense. Um, so, yes, and it's not just intermittent fasting. There are other, other uh, types of fasting as well. And, and Elaine, it looks like you're showing off some uh, good cut uh, and decreased body fat there. William Thurman, I am currently on a 48-hour fast. Good for you. I was doing, I've gone many years doing either a one 36 hour fast or a 48 hour fast once a week. I'm not doing that right now. Here, here's one of the, my reasons. I actually maintain a lower level of body fat when I'm not doing intermittent fasting. And that's actually consistent with, a, with an article we covered from JAMA, Journal of the AMA. About three or four months ago, the, the question was, gosh, why are we still debating Inter intermittent fasting. Now, if you go back and you look at that JAMA article, and we covered it in, the, in the video, they were looking at ability, ability to lose weight. They were not looking at the biomarkers, the uh, autophagy, some of the other little bit more technical issues that go on and that you can look at with fasting. You do, do get increase, increases in those anti-inflammatory biomarkers you get increases in autophagy, things like that when you do uh, uh, intermittent fasting. But for some people, uh, at least in that study, and I'm clearly one of them, I can actually keep my weight down a little bit better with uh, when I'm doing three small meals compared to intermittent fasting. I'm a little bit, at least in terms of my population, my, my viewers, my subscribers, I'm a little bit unusual in that space. James, I know, I'm pretty sure you do uh, intermittent fasting. Is that correct? It's much more consistent with my fasting than I am with my diet. And I'm not criticizing my diet, but um, rarely, rarely, rarely. And breakfast is my favorite meal, but that's usually the one I skip. So I'm going to say 13 out of 14 days, 
maybe even more, maybe 20 out of 21, I'm, I'm intermittent fasting and usually skipping breakfast, but also do the 36 to 48 hours. Well, I'm, I'm at somewhere around 36 right now, uh, a little over 24. Well, go to dinner the day before, whatever that equals up to. So, um, Bottom line is fasting is healthy. It does make a lot of uh, a lot of good things. And in fact, when you go back, you want to get political and religious. Nothing's more political than religion. When you look at the and I got this from Jason Fung is it's a good point. He said when you go back and you look at the um, leaders of religion in in history, Jesus, uh, Mohammed, uh, Buddha, Buddha. There was Confucius. There was one thing they all agreed on, and that was fasting. Yep. If you have to ask, you have the wrong mindset. Not sure what that's about. That, that goes back to the that came in when the question came up about what's the where's a place at the, above thirty. That was that. Oh, good point. Okay, great. Uh, make sure Alan, uh, Elaine says a uh, nice and then says, make sure when you eat, you're in a surplus, take E A A. Not familiar with E A A. Health is wealth. Arnold, a goat, maybe greatest of all time. I'm, I'm lean 365 days a year, eight to 10% body fat, muscle loss due to inactivity. You need to work out. Very true. I thought Arnold was a pig. Well, I don't think it's a lot, a lot of fat you can't see. James, any have you gone through the rest of these comments? We've got other, have we got others that we need that we really need well, to cover? There, we, there continues to be uh, great comments uh, and uh, some some questions you could get back to uh, the individuals, but uh, but nothing that uh, we have someone on from Saudi Arabia. So fantastic. Um, and, uh, and a good roll tide comment in there. So, uh, okay. mo mostly comments on, on other people, but again, we love this feedback. We love to hear what we'd love to hear what they think we ought to cover. What's interest on theirs. We get a lot, the vaccine, the COVID, the weight loss, the fasting, all of these are common threads that we get a lot of comments, a lot of interest in. So fill in some of the other questions that you may uh, have. And we would, uh, uh, but love to follow up. There was one technical question, a recent British study of IFN, AR2, TYK2, OS, OAS1, DPP9 uh, on the severity of uh, COVID. That would be a great topic. We may uh, get Gilbert or, or Chris to grab that question. And that's a great conversation to have with Dr. Vigorous when we have him on soon. Um, and what, what particular genes may be impacting probably the hypersensitivity to uh, inflammation markers and, and uh, see how that impacts it. But good question. We could probably dig into that and find some answers. Very good. Actually, there are a couple I'd like to respond to real quick. Elaine makes a great comment. Glucose damages your endothelium. It's not just sugar. It's in fact, most of my patients get a lot more carbs from grains, grain products than they do from sugars themselves. But yes, that's what damages the endothelium. That damaged endothelium lets LDL pass through and it gets lodged in the artery wall. That is the essence of the mechanism of creating uh, atherosclerosis. Um, John's bringing up a really good point. All of these other methods, uh, especially just looking at scales, uh, are really bad ways of trying to estimate body fat. DEXA scan is a great way of measuring it. Electrical impedance used to be something that's been around about 40 years. It, it doesn't work very well either. I know there are a lot of uh, mechanisms out there. Bart Robinson said, how about 10 milligrams of Crestor every other day uh, <clears throat> to maybe decrease uh, the glucose, the, the hyperglycemia reaction? I think that's valid. I've got tons of people on five milligrams every other day. So again, thanks, James. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't have any, again, great comments. I appreciate the feedback. Um, Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, didn't come up here, but in your presentation, that was mine, but I think it's interesting. 
So we know that the ACE, the ACE receptors seem to be the uptake for the virus. So many people, myself included, are on ACE inhibitors. Uh, so very early on, it was actually the opposite. Some of the studies, some of the concerns anecdotally was be careful if you're taking ibuprofen or be careful if you're on an ACE inhibitor. So any thoughts you have on the, we already know there is some cardio positive effect in general on being an, besides just lowering your blood pressure, but anything you can see if you're on an ACE inhibitor, is that helping in any protective way from what you've seen against the uptake if the ACE receptors are the mechanism? It's a great question. Thanks for the reminder. We actually did a couple of uh, videos on that. Very early on, there was a article that got lots of play. I, th I can't remember if it was in Lancet. It was in one of the leading journals. And they came out saying, we think being on an ACE inhibitor is a risk factor for getting COVID if you get coronavirus infection major reaction all over the world because there are tons of people on ACE inhibitors. In fact, for many reasons, ACE inhibitors are far better than the more popular uh, drugs that people have uh, tend to be on, especially things like um, um, fluid pills uh, so uh, and beta blockers. Um, so obviously there was a major reaction among the medical community uh, tons of studies came out uh, very quickly about that. Um, and sure enough, there was that did not pan out. Uh, being on an ACE inhibitor did not appear to be a risk. That didn't answer your specific question. Your specific question was, is it a benefit? And there was no evidence that it was a benefit either. Part of the original uh, concern about it being a risk was this. Uh, if you're uh, if you're taking an ACE inhibitor, your body's always trying to achieve balance in something. So there was the perception that you increased the number of ACE receptors in your body uh, as a result of uh, ACE inhibitors. At the end of the day, no, it's not. It's not a risk factor for COVID, and it's not a. It doesn't really help. Uh, haven't seen significant evidence that I've seen in either direction. Great point. Thanks for bringing, bringing it up. And I think we're getting uh, the, we still have other comments. Sorry, we couldn't get to all of them. Uh, appreciate the interest. And I think we're going to have to, uh, to say goodbye until next week. Thank you, Ford. Do a great job as always on behalf of the audience. Well, thank you, James.